student, Nathan Ashcraft. He takes, uh, he, he takes um, a class called Energy Ventures, which Georgina Campbell took, who is from Cardiff. And um, he loves, he, he really gets into it. But he's a PhD, and he, he, he wants to start a company. And so after, uh, he took the class before he finished his PhD. So he finishes the PhD over the, over the summer. He comes back um, in September, and then he, um, he's written a business plan, and he said, I come in, he goes, Bill, will you help me raise money and for, for my new company? It's called Dipole, and it's a membrane technology from the material science group at MIT. Don't worry about, you know, too much about the technology. This, this is, and, and I say, all right, what, you know, what, you want me to help you raise money? And he gives me something like this. He says, yeah, here's, my, here's the business plan based on kind of the format that you had for the class, and um, uh, can you help me raise money? I say, well, tell me about it more I, before I have to read through the whole thing. I knew you'd say that. Let me give you my elevator pitch. Here's the elevator pitch in one slide. Dipole is a membrane science that my PhD thesis over here, and basically it is, uh, it is a breakthrough um, technology that allows you to get 53% more power output than other membranes before it. So this means that fuel cells will now be so something. And everybody wants power. The market is infinite here. It's the whole world. And by the way, it also decreases methanol. Methanol being very bad for the environment, this will decrease methanol output by two orders of magnitude. Very compelling value proposition. And not only is this a technology in the lab, we have figured out how to make it into a product. So I have a value proposition, I have a product now, and by the way, that product is protected through the intellectual property. Um, so, you're, do you like this? You're, you're, you're the professor. Do you like this? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So, what do, what do we do? What do you tell, what do you tell Nathan? Go find a customer. Everybody. Do, do, you, do you use power? You're not thinking big enough. <laughs> what do you do? Are you a professor? Are you an entrepreneur? Uh, academic, yes. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Team, yeah. Questions about team, questions about market. Competitors, competitive advantage, yeah. Think about the competitors. Costs, how much does it cost? Okay. So let me tell you what I told them. I, you know, we, we, we do the exercise. We're gonna, I want to save from other exercise. This one's quite simple. What I told him was, uh, Nathan, you need to talk to a friend of mine's uh, kid named Alex. And he said, what does Alex do? I said, he's in the lemon business. He goes, no, Bill. God. This is not synthetic biology. This is membrane science. You know, you're really, you got it wrong. I said, no, I'm not talking about synthetic biology. I'm talking about what Alex does is he squeezes lemons, he puts water in that lemon juice, and he puts sugar in it, and he does this amazing thing. He then takes that le lemonade, and he, he gives it to these people, and then there's this amazing thing that they give him money. It goes like this, you know. He gets money for it. And he was looking at me like you're looking at me right now. Like, are you insulting me? And I said, Nathan, the first lecture of every class that I teach says there is one single and necessary and con sufficient condition for a business. And if you have this condition, you have a business. And if you don't have this condition, you do not have a business. And what is that condition, sir? You need a paying customer. If you do not have a paying customer, you do not have a business. There is no business here, and you do not have an analysis of the business. What you have here is a science fair project presentation. Everybody got that? And, and that's not what we do. We, we're not the Martin Trust Center for MIT science fair projects. We're for entrepreneurship, and the central theme for entrepreneurship is you must get paying customers. At the center of everything you do, if it, there's not, a, a paying customer, and we're going to break that down a little bit later, to, 
you don't have a business. So don't make business more complicated than it needs to be. You got to get paying customers and you don't have an analysis here of your customers. You were right, but you ruined the drama, so I had to cut you off there, sir. <laughs> but, but that's correct. You have to always understand at the end of the day, the single necessary and sufficient condition for a business is a paying customer. And if you lose that focus because you're thinking about all these other things, you've lost what at, should be at the middle of yours. Yes, all these other things that we talked about, competition, costs, intellectual property, all that supports it, but at the central part of it, you need to have customers. Everybody got that, all right? Next one, all right? Um, so uh, this is, this is uh, let me just consolidate the story. I have a student who is an engineer, and uh, Erdine, uh, he goes to a Rensselaer Polytech in upstate New York, and he, um, he, does, he, he does really well um, there as an engineer, and he goes um, and works at General Motors after he graduates. And he then um, uh, realizes that he likes cars, but he wants to get on the business side. He doesn't just want to grind the stuff out, some of the interesting stuff. So after like six, seven years at, at GM, he then leaves to go to a company called Anderson Consulting, which is now called Accenture. I don't know if you have that over here. And uh, it's kind of, and he thinks he's going to get from the technology side to, more to the business side. Well, he does a little bit, but he's a good engineer, so they keep, keep him in that. And so finally, he ends up going after four years there, he ends up going back to MIT for an MBA. Um, you have MBAs over here? Yes, management by arrogance. And... Uh, <laughs> And so he gets, uh, he, he takes entrepreneurship classes, he does really, really well, and he decides he really wants to jump completely away from this so he doesn't just get pegged as an engineer the rest of his life, even though he enjoys it, and he becomes a product manager for a high-tech company out in Silicon Valley, think Google. And he, make, he, he figures out how do you do this stuff to figure out who customers are and, and build that. And he does really, really well. Makes a lot of money in, in Silicon Valley um, getting people to click on ads. And so he decides, well, you know, um, this has been great. I made a lot of money. Uh, you know, I'm getting older. I want to go back to, you know, he's getting to be his mid-40s. He wants to go back to where the weather is better. He wants to move back to Boston um, where he doesn't have to deal with sun and things like that anymore. And... Um, and so he, he, go, he, he, he takes it, leaves his job, goes back and says, what business can I create where I can run it? Because I want to I have the clean slate and do it myself. So he looks around, looks at a lot of different things. He decides, damn, I always loved cars. Why don't I tie in the cars with my business stuff? And he decides that there is no good Lamborghini dealership. Do you have Lamborghinis over here? Not many. And there are not many in Boston, all right? There are not many in Boston. And, and, and at the time, Lamborghini is not owned by a uh, Volkswagen group. It is, and, and the Lamborghini uh, looks like this. It costs four, $400,000. Do you have these types of Lamborghinis over here? Yeah. So he loves this, and he wants to do that by, he wants to set up a Lamborghini, and he, and he does the analysis, and there's nobody else who has a, a really good Lamborghini dealership. And he wants to bring kind of this experience, not just the car, but the whole experience to the United States. Like Starbucks brought, you know, Italian coffee. He wants to kind of be the Italian super high-end luxury car experience. So, and, and, and he has this plan so that northern New England, um, yeah, that's, we're going to just work with me here, all right? <laughs> so you got Maine, New Hampshire. Um, Vermont, and uh, then you've got Massachusetts, and you've got part of Connecticut here, the non-New York part. And he does his analysis and finds out there's about 2,500 people who are good candidates for him to buy a Lamborghini in, in the northern New England area. And, uh, and he sees his growth plan is to, is to sell to this people the whole experience. So not just the car, but 
coming to it, getting it serviced uh, over and over again, buying more. And then, but the real opportunity is probably down here in, in Connecticut and New York, where you're going to get 10,000 plus of them, he's estimating. Because uh, this is big money down here. And then, it, and then you could go down to Mid-Atlantic, to D.C. and Philly and uh, Baltimore. And this, but this is probably like similar to Massachusetts, uh, I'm sorry, northern New England. It's more than 2,500. Two but you can see an interesting thing. And, and if you know the Jamil Group, so I don't know if you know the Jamil Group, but they've kind of done this model in the Middle East with Toyota. And you, you can, it can be very profitable. So he analyzes it, says, I'm going to start up here. This is my beachhead market. He looks around and says, Boston, because when he lays out where the people are, his potential prospects, Boston's best thing. He goes and he builds this, he gets a spot in Boston and Back Bay, for those of you who know Boston. This is a good place where you would do it. He gets on, 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 uh, on Commonwealth Avenue and he builds this beautiful space to bring people in. And it has these things called nano walls, top to bottom glass like you'd see in a, in a modern cafe that you can see through, but when it's nice, you open it up. And then inside, he's got a Lamborghini, you know, here. Quakes, you know, as you see up there, draw attention. He's got pictures of beautiful people frolicking with other beautiful people in Monaco. Um, very beautiful people, uh, like Leonard DiCaprio and George Clooney before he got married. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he's got that. And then he has um, two technicians in here who are really, really good. They can fix anything. So if you bring your car in, you can have a Android 3 phone, and they can still fix that. They can fix anything you want in the car. They're fantastic engineers. And then to kind of cap it off, he makes some other investments in here. But to have this total experience when you walk in there, he goes out and he goes and he personally brings back not a great coffee machine, but an epic espresso machine that costs $75,000 from Italy. So when you come to this place, you don't forget the whole experience. When you walk in there, it's like, whoa, there's a Lamborghini. This is, like, this is what I want to be. And there's the coffee, and then you have that. Everybody got it? Cost, cost them, by the way, over $2 million to set this up. So he invests. And he has a grand, you know, he's done his work. He has his launch party, um, and he launches. And, and he has like week one, um, he has like 100 people come to the launch, 100 plus people, and it's a grand event. And, that, and that's on Saturday. And then on Sunday, he's going to be open seven days a week, not, and, but not that one. Um, they were recovering. And Thursday, Friday. And so he kind of does that, and then he gets down to business. But nobody shows up at the shop. Zero people the first week. Oh, no problem. This, the, the word's getting out. The word's getting out. But nobody shows up the second week. Well, not a problem. Let's take out an ad. Let's, let's get the word out. You know, let's kind of do some things. And, uh, but again, third week, nobody shows up, even though he takes out an ad in the Boston Globe. So he says, think about it. Maybe we should take out an ad in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal as well. So he, 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 he does this. But nothing seems to work here. And he, this goes on for six weeks. All right? And getting a little tense now after six weeks, <laughs> just to be clear. These guys in the back have been drinking a lot of the espresso because they got nothing else to do. <laughs> They've seen all the YouTube videos about fixing things back there. And every night now, they're starting to clean out their browser history, if you know what I mean. And so, so, but then what happens on the seventh week on Monday morning at 11.30 AM is up drives a two and a half year old Volvo. Now, this is, this is seven years ago before Volkswagen bought Lamborghini and Volkswagen was bought by the Chinese, OK? It was still the kind of old school Volvo that we remember. And 
and up drives a two and a half year old Volvo and out jumps Laura. Laura went to school with her dean, but she is seven years younger than him because while he had gotten all that experience before he went for an MBA, she went to an Ivy League school. She went to Princeton, came right out of Princeton, worked at Goldman Sachs for two years, and then went in and got her MBA. And then she popped out and he'd kind of lost touch with her, but he know, he'd known she'd gone to McKinsey, this high-end top consulting firm. And so, and Laura jumps out and says, hey, Ardeen, it's great to see you. We haven't, I haven't, you know, I haven't seen you for 10 years since the reunion. And um, he goes, yeah, it's great to see you. And he's thinking, what's going on? He goes, she said, I live by, by here and I drive by here all the time. He goes, how did you know I was here? She goes, oh, the class notes, I saw it. Now you have those great technicians in the back. And, and so I was really interested to see it. And so I thought today after I dropped my daughter off over here, um, I, she's at daycare, and he goes, oh, you have a daughter? He goes, oh, I have, I have two of them. One's, one's eight and goes to Windsor School, and the one goes to daycare over here, and I drop her off two days a week. And uh, he goes, that's fantastic. Are you still working at McKinsey? He goes, no, I left McKinsey, you know, you know about five years ago, but I'm really involved in my, my, my kids' schools now. And uh, that's great. She goes, are you, are you enjoying it, life in general? She goes, oh, I love it. My husband teaches at BC law school, and we go hiking up in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Um, it's great. It is really great. We get to spend a lot of time with the kids. And um, he said, that's wonderful. She said, we should get together sometime. And uh, she, he says, sure, sure. I'm thinking, OK. <laughs> um, but he didn't, like Garris said, pull out his phone right away and book the meeting. She said, uh, I would, you know, but I also have a, a business proposition here that I would like to put on the table, or Dean. What I would like to do is I, I, I would like to offer you something that I think will help you and will help me. When I was growing up, I used to go with my father and we would get our car fixed. And the mechanic would explain what was going on. And then when he fixed it, we knew what was going on and if something happened. And, and I always liked that. Now when I go to get my Volvo fixed, they always say, it's a computer. And they don't explain to me anything, like I'm stupid. And then it costs $1,500, and then something happens later, and I bring it back and say, what's going wrong now? And they say, it's computer again, and then they have to do something. And that's not the case. I know that's not the case. But I don't know what to do, and I don't trust them, but I do trust you. And so what I want to suggest is, you've got those great maintenance people in the back, don't you? I, that's what I read about. He goes, yeah, they can do anything. They, I'd like you to check out my Volvo and tell me if there's anything wrong. And I, it, it, if just for maintenance, I'll, I'll pay you. And if there's anything else you need to fix, just tell me what it is, and I'll pay you up to $1,500, no question asked. And I know you're thinking, well, I make as much money as if I worked on a Lamborghini. I went to, I went to, I have an MBA too. I am going to offer you margins that are the same or close to what you got. Let's call it. 70, 80 percent gross margin. That means this is going to be profitable for you. So, um, so here's the question. Um, Erdine's thinking, wow, this what an opportunity. What are you going to do? You're at your tables now. What are you going to do? Now, I want you to understand your technicians can definitely fix anything related to this car. They can get the parts. There is nothing that will affect your Lamborghini dealership. There is nothing that will affect the warranty of this two and a half year old Volvo. The question I have for you, you at your tables is what are you going to do? Everybody got this? I'm Laura. I'm going to go get some espresso and I will be back in four minutes and I need an answer. And I want you to tell me what are you going to do and why are, you, why are you doing it? What are the pros and cons? All right, let's, 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 make, this, let's make this simple here. Why would, you, why would you take it? We'll start with table three. Give me one reason. Cash. cash. Do we like cash? Yes. Yeah. Business depends on cash. Cash is oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, the body dies. The business dies. OK. That's pretty low on Maslow's hierarchy. Necessary. Table two, what do you got? Yeah. We like, we listen to customers, right? Listen to customers. They, this customer is a paying customer. 
Do we like paying customers? Yeah. Table two, do you want to add something? You're smiling in a very devilish way. What does that mean? Pivot. Yeah. Pivot. Let's get, let's let, let let's let's before we go to ugly babies, like everyone here, we're pivoting. You've heard that, right? We pivot. We're we're lean, lean, mean entrepreneurs. We pivot, right? That's it. Now let's go to ugly babies. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's exactly where we're going to put the technology on Okay. So all we had before was a concept. As they say, in concept, concept and reality are the same thing. In reality, concept and reality are usually totally different, right? Everybody got that? Get out of the, get out of the building and go talk to people. See the whites of their eyes. Okay? Table five. Why else? She's a friend, you know, she has expertise, you know, it's, it's traffic, you know, um, it's traffic, traffic, good? Yeah. Spare time as well. Spare, yeah, traffic, she, so you're getting to, is this word of mouth? Visibility. Word of mouth, visibility, uh, what, what was the other thing? Is that a reason to do it or not do it? <laughs> what? Yeah, you have the you have the, the resources are there. You have a sunk cost. You had two people that are that are you got to pay them anyway. This could be a morale issue, right? Where they're saying, "What are we doing?" And you, all of a sudden, you got somebody there. Is is, is this an interest pivoting? Is this this could be a new market, a new business, right? Prep meets opportunity. Customer, yeah, we're customer driven. It's kind of like a, uh, we didn't put that down there, but morale, kind of like customer driven. We do what customers want, right? It's kind of a, a, a values thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to just emphasize that. What else? Yeah. Trust network effects, word of mouth network effects, right? What, what about anybody else? That, yes, LTV. What about potential upselling opportunities? Yeah. Well, you're shutting the. It sounds like you're shutting the door on them. Sounds a little like you know some biases here. <laughs> why can't Why can't Laura have excitement in her life? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone had their hand up back here. A loner. No, th this is the upselling opportunity, right? The, kind of related to that, upselling. She, she, she arrives home and her husband says, what do you have, Laura? You know, <laughs> Gee, I'd like to drive that around. And you're getting some free advertising with Laura's friends, co community. Yes. Yeah. New business. OK. So we started off with some wackadoodles back there who said no. <laughs> so let's just let's do a quick vote. How many of you? W well, we didn't give a chance for the other people to to do it. But what was your what was yours reason? It's not our customer. Oh, here it comes. Get ready. The B word's coming. We would dilute our brand. Is that where, is that where you're going? I, I love that. I hear that from my MBAs all the way. It's a brand. What, what does that mean? Lifetime value of the customer. Wait, that's on this sheet. Yeah. It's what your customer sees, so your reputation. OK, how's that working? <laughs> <laughs> what, what we didn't know, 
Yeah, so by the way, I am, I, you know, I do teach MBAs. So, you know, that I teach engineers, I teach all, all the different types of people. But I'm always skeptical of like, con, con, you know, things that are too conceptual. <laughs> I want it to be real. I want it to be real. So when people say stuff, what do they mean by this? And I, and, and I want to see it translated into concrete things. Someone shows up and they, and they want to buy a Lamborghini. What do you do with the Volvo? It's kind of like when you're getting on the British Airways flight and someone's in economy and someone's in first class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to me like a solvable problem, all right? So your answer is let's get some spreadsheets out. <laughs> all right, let's, let's let, we, we, everyone's had their say. Let's vote now, okay? How many of you take the business? How many of you don't take the business? Oh, wow, we had some sleepers up here. <laughs> All right. So, so, but this, we just made this up. This would never happen in real life. Like, this is like total fantasy that you'd be selling product A and someone comes in and wants to buy product B. That would never happen in your business. <laughs> Everybody get it? That's sarcasm. Do you have that? <laughs> Uh, and this used to, ha so you all have, we have, has everyone here an entrepreneur? Has everyone been an entrepreneur? Yeah. So you all have had this problem. Yes? Yeah. And it could be as simple as, I don't want to buy your product, I want to hire you to do some services yeah. for me. That's a, the most common one when you first get started. You're, you seem like a very smart, smart person. I would like to hire you. I don't want your product, but I will, hi I'd like to hire you at, you know, $100 an hour. So what do you do? And, and uh, this is the problem that I had in my businesses, and it always used to bug me. Because how do you think about this? You know, how do you decide? Do you take the business or not? You know? Um, and it, it gets at you. you. Do you know for sure you should take the business, or do you not know? Does anyone know for sure whether you take it? Someone said, well, it depends, you know. Uh, how do you think about this problem? Because for me, it was like, did the Celtics win last night, the, the Boston basketball team? Because if they did, I felt good, and then I would take the business. And if they didn't, you know, I heard a bad song on the way to work that day, I might not take the business. There was not a systematic way for me to think about this. And that always bothered me. So how should we think about this? Is there a systematic way to think about this? So we're going to come back to that. That is a long-term opportunity. But in business, there are short-term needs and long-term opportunities. So what I'm going to, I, I'm, let me just fast forward here. In, if we had a, this would be a whole class at, at MIT. Um, the first question that you should always think about, which some of you were doing, which I cut off my friend in the back because, again, he was being you for this exercise, uh, is um, who is your customer? Who is your customer? Whenever you have a business, you have to understand who is your target customer. And then you need to test that. Entrepreneurship is about a hypothesis, testing it, refining it over and over again until you get better and better and better at it. Who is your customer, all right, if you're a Lamborghini dealership? We're going to develop a persona. This is called a demographic psychographic, okay? Who is your customer if you're a Lamborghini dealership? Let's just, okay? Let's, so let, let, we're going to get much more specific about this, okay? And, we're, and, and when you do a persona, they have a name and it's actually a real person, okay? So let's start out with the most fundamental demographic. Is it male or female? Male. Gender bias. What? Yeah. Okay, so, 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 <laughs> see, so there's a lot of gender bias flying out here, and I just have to, <laughs> we just have, look, this is not, uh, just to be clear, 
what we're doing right now is not a moral crisis, all right? <laughs> I want to be clear. If someone, if, if Anna walks into the store and I look at her and I say, I can't sell you a car, you're a woman, that's illegal, all right? Everybody get that? That's illegal. But when you develop products, do you develop a demographic psychographic that you're targeting? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this has been done for a long time, and you're not putting anybody in jail. You're just trying to figure out who is your target customer, and then you tweak the product to do those things. Um, it might be the same product, and you might have a version for this demographic site graph and this one, and you change the color, you change something else. And when you look at successful entrepreneurship, when you look at Silicon Valley, one of the most common companies, if not the most common, among successful entrepreneurs, among successful VCs, is not IBM. It's not Intel. Does anybody know what company it is? You'd be surprised. Sorry? No? It's Procter & Gamble, which you, you have Unilever over here, right? Yeah. Why is it Procter & Gamble? Because Procter & Gamble does this stuff really, really well. This is the, 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 the cool name for it now is called design thinking. That's what but they've been doing this forever. It's like, who is your customer? And then you build a very clear demographic psychographic. So you see Simon Sinek. Have you ever seen the TED Talk by Simon Sinek? Don't think about the how and the what. Think about the why, all right? And this is precisely what we're gonna be doing. Entrepreneurs often start saying, focusing on the product. They put the product at the middle as opposed to the customer. Building off what we just said, we're talking about before, you gotta put the customer at the center. And who is this demographic psychographic? And I will tell you, having done this and looked into this, the demographic psychographic for a Lamborghini owner is over 97% of the owners are male. Okay? Whether you like that or not, that is what, if you want to be a successful Lamborghini dealership, you need to understand that. All right? So we're going to give this person a name, and his name we're going to, is Giovanni. Right? He was known as Georgios when he grew up. In, in, he, he, he lived in New Jersey off six, exit 17W. He was a first generation of a Greek family, and his family was very poor, but they, and he was so poor that they had to, he had to wear the same clothes often. He had the cheapest sneakers that he wore to school. People made fun of him because he went to Rutgers, and then he went to get it. A, an accounting degree, and he's a partner in an accounting firm, and he has done really, really well now. All right? He is male. How old is he? Late 40s. Late 40s. Yep. Late 40s. We'll come back to that in a second. That is correct. Now, now we're, what we're doing is we're not getting every single Lamborghini owner. We're getting, you know, the middle of the bell curve, our best target. There are, Tom Brady would own one. Tom Brady is the, he doesn't. But some famous athlete in, in Boston would own it. But there aren't a lot of those people. There turns out there are a lot of people that we're gonna build this demographic, psychographic for. Okay, how, how, much, how much does he make per year? Sorry? Yeah, Let, that's, that is correct, let's be even more more so. Yeah. So we have to figure out. So his, 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 his net income divided by N must equal in excess, much in excess of $2 million per year. Right? So he's got to clear $2 million and haven't done it for a while and accumulated it, which is one of the reasons why we talk about being in his mid to late 40s is a very clear demographic, psychographic of your target customer here. So they've made a lot of money. Does anyone know what N is? Very close. N is the number of divorces that he's had, right? <laughs> Which is why you have to take his net income and then you have to divide it by the number of divorces he has, right? How, how many divorces has he had? At least one. Yeah, at least one. Probably, probably like two, right? <laughs> All right? So, 
So he's had probably two divorces. What is his current marital status? She's had a divorce. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So we call it functionally single. Um, <laughs> right? And um, I'm not asking you to like this person. We're just using this as an exercise here. All right? This is someone who's been married multiple times, might have kids. Does he have a good relationship with the kids? No. No, he basically, on weekend, no, it's more writing a check for them. Where, where do you find this person on weekends? Where's. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not so much the golf clubs, right? You know, I'm sorry, but you probably, maybe you don't know this person. Uh, I, uh, they have private, they have, they, they have private jets, and they, ha or they, they share. Uh, private jets with other people. So they will go to, on Saturday nights if they're in Boston, they go to um, certain nightclubs. Not any nightclub, like the highest end nightclubs. You've probably seen it in the movies and they have like the velvet things around them and, um, and they make a scene of themselves and then they want Tom Brady to come sit with them or whoever it is, right? So they're going to the high end clubs or they're going to Hanscom Field to get their jet to fly out to Las Vegas for the Pacquiao Mayweather fight, or they're flying off to Monaco to go gallivant with beautiful people, or for, for something that they're doing, right? Or they fly off to Italy to do, um, you know, something there. Uh, so there. So a watering hole is Hanscom Field in Boston, where they have their jets. The, it, uh, another place you'll find them is at those high, high-end nightclubs, you know. Um, you know, uh, what type of job do they have? You, you, so first of all, hedge fund managers, right? You, you, it's, it's surprising they are not entrepreneurs very often, very unusual. It's much more hedge fund managers, right? Do, do you know why? Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> why would you become a hedge fund manager? <laughs> What's your, what's your drive to become a hedge fund manager? Money. Money. I got to show you I got, I, I'm going to make a lot of money, right? And so hedge fund managers. What else? Well, you might not know this, so let me just fast forward here. It is, it is often partners in like, this is shocking, in accounting firms, in law firms, because th they make enormous amounts of money. And, and it's it, it very hard work. And the more, harder you work, the more you make it. It, it. So this person is in pursuit of accumulating things to make up for the fact that they didn't have money earlier. This is how they do their psychological compensation in life, right? They are pursuing things over people for the time being because they got to show that, that that's, that's how they feel good about themselves, right? Um, uh, you, we could tell you what type of clothes they get. Oh, by the way, the other one is, is, is real estate, right? It's partners in law firms, accounting firms. Uh, hedge fund managers is probably the biggest one. Um, real estate it, it is, is another big one. That, that's where you're going to find them. Um, you, you could find them at Hanscom Field. You, you could see them going to Las Vegas. They're not going to be at their kid's soccer game on, on, on Saturday morning, right? This, everybody got this? You know, we could, we could really drill down and do a lot more. By, by the way, does this person exist? Does, maybe? Yeah. But you could imagine someone like this. The person does exist. This person does exist. I'm not asking you to like the person, but this is an exercise to show you. And if we start, you start understanding this person, whether you like it or not, why are they buying a Lamborghini? Are they buying a Lamborghini because it's the most cost-effective way to get from point A to point B with the lowest carbon footprint in the most mechanically sound way? The, sorry, which, I like that. It is a recognition machine. Recognition of what? I got it, you don't, right? Can you picture this person driving up to the nightclub? Do they park their car and, and then wait in line? 
Yeah, say, go ahead. How did they do it? The, the, all the proletariat are waiting in line, and they come up and drive up to the front, and then what happens? They leave the car running, and they just hop out with their, with their clothes, not Armani, but clothes that are beyond Armani that have been custom made for them, and then they go in, and the, the, the valet runs out to, 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 take, to take their car in front of all the other people, right? And then they open up the side door, and what pops out of the, side, of the passenger side? A trophy date. No, it's not their wife. <laughs> uh, uh, everybody got this? So they are buying a recognition machine, or they are buying image. This is what you, this is what you need to understand, not just demog the demographics help you start to understand the psychographics. People don't buy on, based on demographics. They buy based on psychographics. But the demographics help you identify them and find them and then give you hints as to even within that demographic, this is the psychographic we're looking for. And what they are buying is image. Now you'll say, oh, that's, uh, guess what? You can go through any car. People don't buy cars because they're the most economically sound investment. People buy Priuses. When you buy a Prius, you're making a statement. You have Priuses over here, right? Yeah. When you, uh, every, I had this person who, who, a student, and he, he swore he could sit down with someone for two minutes and ask them questions, and he could not only tell you what type of car they, they had, he could tell you the color of the car they had. And, and it, was, it was quite remarkable to see him do this stuff. Um, so when we buy stuff, there is a lot of hints as to what, why we buy it. We don't, we're not as rational as you, as you would like to think. And I'm going to talk about B2C here. This, the same process works. Everybody got this? Oh, but before we leave this, some of you started to use some numbers. You started to use some numbers, and I had to cut you off. What is the LTV of a Giovanni? You don't need a spreadsheet for this. Just give me a ballpark. How much does a car cost? 400000 It's going to be very profitable. He's going to do, is he going to be concerned about maintenance? Here are the keys. Fix it, you know. Um, and then he shows up at the nightclub, and he drops it off, and then behind him pulls up, you know, Santiago. And Santiago has a better Lamborghini. What happens then? Yeah, because it's not enough. The recognition machine has to be the best recognition machine. And remember, he's got lots of money. He doesn't have lots of friends, right? So the money is not the issue here. Uh, so the LTV, is it $10,000? Is it $100,000? Is it a million dollars? Yeah. It could be a million dollars. Got it. Everybody got that? So now to, to what you started to do, and I had to cut you off, because you would have ruined kind of this whole exercise. <laughs> Much like you. you. You two have a lot in common. <laughs> um, is, uh, is, this, now, now, is this an interesting market? If you can get over the fact that you don't dislike this person. But your dean was in the demographic psychographic. Yeah. Uh, the dean was in the psychographic. Yeah. I'm going to come back. I, 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 let me come back to that. All right. I'm going to come back to that. Your, your question is a good one. Is this? Is this? Is that, and, and I will tell you, you should never do a business where you dislike your customer or you don't feel comfortable with it. That's not. That's not successful. But in this case, let's let's just go through the process here. This is this is a metaphor, right? The LTV here is like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Could be a million. And by the way, once you get one Giovanni, he goes to Hanscom Field, and now the game is on. Now the game is on, all right? And I'm going to come back to the point you made is this is, makes sense in concept. And now let me just say, and I'm going to just fast forward because we're five minutes to the break, is 
Laura demographic looks like what? We could go down and do this. She's in her late 30s, right? She is a female. She is happily married two kids, right? Where is she on Saturday morning? At, at, yeah, at ballet, at, at soccer, you know. Um, where is she at, when, at Saturday nights? You know, you don't have it over here, I don't think, but she's at Chunky e. Cheeses. Do you have Chuck E. Cheeses? Do you have Chuck E. Cheeses here? You, you're so lucky. Uh, but but it's, it's a totally different persona, where does she go shopping, she'll go to Costco, what, you know, where, is she, where, where is she when he's out gallivanting at parties and, and working late at night, she's at the PTO, you know, what's the, what's the income of her family, or what's her income? Well, in this case, her income unit is not divided by N, it is the whole household income, and it's probably like $300,000, right? And we could go down where she shops, what watering holes, what it, but at the end of the day, and, you know, we could go down and people go, oh, she has a golden retriever. When I do this when we're longer, you can really get into this, right? And, and then you start to understand what is, she, what, what's, what, what, if this person's number one, you know, priority was image, I got it, you don't. What's the number one priority of Laura? No. Well, are you married? Wow, maybe it's different <laughs> over here. What's her number one priority? Kids, yeah. That, that's what I mean. It, when you're married, you realize uh, kids are here, the dogs are here, the garbage is here, and you're here and, and as a husband, and you've got to take the garbage out uh, and the dog for a walk. The kids are like, it's a whole other level. It's, family does not equal kids, just to be clear. So. <laughs> Her number one priority is kids. And the more specific you can be, the better, right? And it is the kids. So if $400,000 dropped out, she went and, and, and someone, she won the lottery and got $400,000, is she going to buy a Lamborghini? What are the odds of her buying a Lamborghini? Zero. Zero. And if her husband buys a Lamborghini, N equals one for him, right? <laughs> right? You know where she's going to spend the money. Where is she going to spend the money? She's going to move to another neighborhood. She's going to set up a college fund for the kids in the United States. This is crystal clear what's, what, 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 where it's going to happen. And so her ability to upsell this is, this is not going to happen. It's, she's not going to do that. She's going to buy another two-and-a-half-year-old Volvo, and she's going to invest it in the kids, right? And it's not an accident she has a two-and-a-half-year-old Volvo. Why does she have a Volvo? Exactly. And Volvo crushed this, demo crushed this demographic. And Volvo safety. Let me just show you the ad. Oops, what happened here? Um, Anyway, I have an ad from Volvo that has like a Volvo car with a big truck on it, and it just says Volvo safety. That's all they needed to say, because that's what they want. They want their, they don't care about style. They're not trying to impress people. They are all about safety, and this is why they crush this demographic. And once some other people from the tribe have it, the other people, their friends, then they buy the Volvo, and now you've got this virality kicking in. So are you, if, if, you do, if you take the money from Laura, you are taking a fundamentally different demographic that actually has negative word of mouth here. I want to go back to the point here. You're spending your time with this person who is totally different than this. And if a Giovanni were to ever see a Laura at it or hear of a Laura, this is not good. This reminds him of his first wife that told him what a bum he was and divorced him, right? But, but this is a really good example of word of mouth being totally orthogonal. Now, if it was a Maserati buyer, we could start to rationalize it, but even then you have to realize there's a cost of going off this. So 
This is, you start with your customer, who is your customer? But the reality here is you have to do more than just who is your customer. You have to think about all the different trade-offs. And now I may take the Volvo, but I understand it is the LTV here is going to be $10,000. I am not solving my problem at all. I am just giving myself an aspirin to make it to the next day. I have to perform some fundamental surgery. My business for the Lamborghini dealership has problems. And the problem is, is that I have, I, have not I have not really developed this as robustly as I could, and that I'm sitting back and waiting for people to come into my dealership. What should I be doing? Going to them. Where? At the watering holes. I should be sponsoring things. I should go to the nightclubs. I should sponsor a trip to the Pacquiao Mayweather fight. You can't, you, once you understand this, all of a sudden, this is what really good digital media, digital marketing people do, really good fundamental marketing and sales people do. You have to understand your customer and then spend your time going out there. Have I taken a Volvo? I have taken a Volvo, and you too may have to take a Volvo. But if you take a Volvo, the worst thing that will ever happen to you is you think that's the answer, right? <laughs> um, and that we're still a Lamborghini dealership. Because all you've done is you've made yourself feel good and the surgery is just off. You know, and you have to perform surgery here. And this is what pe entrepreneurs lose focus. And they don't build these. You will not build a highly scalable business if you try to do this and do this. <laughs> They're too orthogonal. Now, again, you got to stay alive, and sometimes you got to take the money, and you might have her put a wig on and sneak around back at 11 o'clock at night. Right? But it, you, this could have all kinds of bad ramifications, because if you do a good job for her, what is she, she going to do? Tell her friends. And who are her, her friends? Other Volvo, Other Volvo owners, right? And so now, all of a sudden, your dealership, where, wherever it was I drew it, you have this beautiful dealership with a $75,000 espresso machine. You have the invasion of the soccer moms around it. And, you're, and now there's no chance if Giovanni gets near it that he, he's going to come in. And you, you've taken, could it be a great business if, with, with all that investment? Yes, because the LTV is so high. But if this is your business, you need to have your infrastructure and cost of customer acquisition much lower and you need to focus like heck on this demographic, and you need to get out to ballet classes and soccer matches in the local store and the Pilates studio and whatever else it is, sponsor a Peloton company. Do you have Pelotons over here? Yeah, but, but you, you have to understand what this demographic will be, will be um, drawn by. So this is a metaphor that is going to go through our, the workshops and goes through our classes as, you know, you need a, first thing, you need a paying customer. Don't forget that. Single necessary and sufficient condition for a paying customer. But is it the right paying customer? And who is your customer? And don't take, don't take, the, don't take the Volvo um, unless it's the last resort and you know that it's just an aspirin. So look, I'm just going to wrap up what we did before. I had this ambition of going through stuff that we do in like, you know, an hour and a half and 30 minutes here. And it's, sometimes it's hard to do that. But I'm going to go, as, I'm going to get as much done and I'll give you some resources afterwards. So um, let, me, let me just wrap this thing up. So how do we handle the situation? We, we, we think about who is the Lamborghini car customer. We think about the Volvo Lamborghini. Why are they buying it? And here was the thing I was telling you. Here's a Volvo, and here's, a, here's this. All you needed was that picture and the word Volvo and safety. Where I remember seeing this, and it didn't have all this. It just said Volvo safety. And that's the power, and we're going to get to this with another example here later. Is you want to know what your value proposition is and be able to just repeat it over and over and over again. And when, when the customer gets sick of it and says it as soon as they see you, that is good. That means you're getting through. And if that's what people mean by brand, then that brand is good. But that's what we're looking for, right? Your target customer, it resonates with them. If this doesn't resonate with uh, Giovanni, we don't care. We do not care. 
Giovanni is not your target customer when you're selling a Volvo, right? So what you want to be is not driven by some abstract stuff you read on the internet. This is going to go to the point, I don't know what your name is, what your name is. Caroline made up here. You don't just sit back and do this stuff uh, by looking on the internet or reading a Forrester study or a Gartner study. Nor do you get driven by one customer who walks through the door. You're driven by a target customer group, and we're going we're gonna to really dive into this. Is this is like this is abstract, you know. This is, you know, driven by one customer. What we're looking for are people who are going to meet three criteria. They're going to buy the same product, they buy it in the same way, and there's word of mouth. That's what you want when you have a great company. What happens then is you can focus on building a great product, not a good product, a great product, and then who's going to sell your product? The customer's going to sell your product. Because the best salesperson you will ever get is not net someone you will hire. It's the existing customers. And this is why customer success investments are so important now. And when your company starts to gain traction having a customer success manager, because the customer who buys your product, be it Giovanni who shows up at Hanscom Field, be it the, the, the Laura who shows up at the ballet classes or the Pilates studio, they already have the credibility. They don't have a badge on them, and they, and they know that people have a relationship. And if they tell other people this is a good product, then they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna buy it much faster, and it doesn't cost you as much. So same product, same sales cycle, same uh, word of mouth. And same sales cycle means if they're all the same, I sell it to her, then I just take exactly the same material, slides, whatever, I sell it to him, I sell it to him, him, her. And I don't have to like reinvent my sales process. Um, and this is not about generalities. This is why I was kind of jumping on the, the brand thing, because I don't want general concepts. I don't want, this is what I read in Harvard Business Review. I want specificity. I want names. I want uh, proxy products, watering holes, things like that. That's what wins in entrepreneurship. Strategy does not win in entrepreneurship. When someone comes in and says to your new startup, I, I'm interested in being the chief strategy officer, uh, that doesn't get traction with me, at least. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about what strategy is in one of the later examples, but it's all about specificity. What exact customer, what exact feature do they need? Uh, and then this just said, you, the, the process of entrepreneurship is coming up with hypotheses, testing them, getting better over time. It's not getting the answer right out of the chute. You gotta just keep moving and try stuff and get better over time. And it's not just about selecting things, it's about deselecting things. This is the F word, focus. Entrepreneurs need focus. The reason why entrepreneurs fail is they run out of money. Why do they run out of money? Because they don't focus enough. So you focus and then find out if it's gonna work. If it's not gonna work, draw and go someplace else. But, um, so we're gonna, I'm going to go show you this later. This is kind of the disciplined entrepreneurship canvas. But I don't want you to take away from this and say never take the Volvo. All right? If once you're successful, you don't need to take the Volvo, don't take the Volvo. But sometimes you have to take the Volvo um, and, but realize it is an aspirin, it is not a cure. It is not a cure, unless, you're, unless you are truly pivoting. But, it, but this idea of lean startup, I had a lot of problems with. And one of them is, we just do it, we just pivot. You can't build some big businesses if you just pivot every time someone walks through the door. You gotta figure out what, what it is in a, in, a, in a very concrete way. Those 2,500 names, so if you were, if you were starting that Lamborghini business, you have 2,500 names. You should have gone through those 2,500 names, known who they are, talked to 500 of them, and said, can we get a pre-order for a Lamborghini? What will it take? And then you would go to them, not sit back and keep them in an abstract way. Um, but sometimes you do have to take the Volvo. I don't want to sit up here on my high horse and say, shame on you for taking the Volvo. Sometimes 
I, I had to take the Volvo when I was an entrepreneur because you need oxygen. Well, you know, when they say on the plane, you know, apply a mask, you know, before you start helping other people. You have to stay in the game, but you're treading water. You're not getting ahead necessarily. Some people take away from this Lamborghini, you should go high end. Not true. This is just a metaphor that says, do one or do the other, but focus on it. And, he, and then the other thing I'll say is that, well, this doesn't work today because now Lamborghini's making an SUV. <coughs> that is true. This met, the story that I just told you really is a metaphor, but at the time it worked well. Today, Lamborghini is making an SUV because they were bought by, um, they were bought by Volkswagen. Do I think that's a good idea? I do not think that's a good idea. I don't think that's going to end well. I think it's a short-term gain by leveraging Lamborghini and you're selling off what it is in the long term. Um, and by the way, Volvo has now moved out of just doing that. And one thing I didn't bring up, Volvo's tagline is safety. Is Volvo the safest car in the world? Probably not, yes, I wouldn't be asking the question, right? All right? If you want a safe car, you could get a Hummer and drive down the middle of the street and it's much, much safer, right? You say, well, that's not a fair analogy. Well, all right, then we're not talking about safety. There's some other trade-offs. But even within that group, the Saab was a safer car than the, than the Volvo. The reality of it was that their perceived value was safety. And they reinforced it over and over again. And it was safe enough that it was certainly in the top quartile, even though it wasn't necessarily the safest one. But because they executed the entire you know, plan of marketing communication, <laughs> um, target customer and all that, and it looked like a safe car. You certainly didn't look like a stylish person driving around a Volvo at the time. Um, and Saab kind of tried to do, was not as clear about what they were doing. Um, so you always want to understand perceived value versus real value. And you have to understand perceived value really matters. It's not just all about real. And how do you do that? You do that by, uh, we're going to talk about building the company from the customer back. Know who your customer is. What do they want to hear? How do you message that? And, and other, other signals. Um, but the frameworks that we're going to give you are helpful to do that, but they don't give you the singular answer. There is not a singular answer. There is just, here's the, 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 the lenses in which you, need, you should be looking at these things that will help you to be more successful. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't get into detail. My first company was called Cambridge Decision Dynamics. And it is in deep, deep stealth mode. You know what that means? It does not exist. Uh, <laughs> and my wife always used to say, I thought of business, money comes in when you have a job. Like, money is only going out in this company. Uh, and that was true. And then my second company was called Sensible, which we're going to talk about next. And that was more successful, which was really easy. But the third company was they were called Visage, and that went from 50 million to half a billion company in two and a half years. And that was less effort than either of the previous two because I knew how to work the odds. You know, just like we were talking about before. I knew how to take informed risk and how to do that. Um, so, but there's not simple answers to this.